Welcome to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where you can learn and be inspired by real-world examples of how technology is transforming businesses and reshaping industries in a language everyone can understand. Here is your host, Neil C. Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. How are you all doing out there? Well, today's guest caught my attention when I heard that he said that the world of modern banking hasn't changed since the 1400s in Florence, Italy. And since then, the power has long been in the hands of an intermediary. And as a result, we've been at the mercy of market fluctuations and currency volatility. But today, with the rise of blockchain, the power is shifting. And Rob Frasca, managing partner at Cosimo Ventures and holder of Endow, the world's first adaptive digital currency, he also stated that this is the single largest value creation event in our lifetime because we're moving to a more resilient networked approach to value and trust exchange. And it's a borderless, resilient value exchange putting financial control back in the hands of people. And this really got me thinking about the parallels between when the internet first arrived and now we're talking about blockchain and crypto and transforming the world. And they just feel like a lot of opportunity out there. So we're going to dive a little bit deeper on all this and more. So buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to Boston so we can speak with Rob Frasca about all this and much more. So a massive warm welcome to the show, Rob. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Yeah. So uh, my name is Rob Frasca, and I'm managing partner of a firm called Cosmo Ventures. It's an early stage blockchain uh, opportunities fund. And I've actually been building companies now as an entrepreneur for, uh, for over 30 years. And uh, my firm, Cosmo Ventures, my partners and I, we've been actively uh, involved now in blockchain for over five years. And the firm is, uh, is around seven years. So we have a lot of fun. We're looking at all these great companies. Love that. And a question I've got to ask is, what's your origin story here? Where was that passion for technology? Where did it come from? And ultimately, what was it that put you on this path that you find yourself on now? So my my path is 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 uh, is a pretty interesting one. It's a pretty crazy one. I, I actually flew jets for the Navy wow. back in the '90s. It was a boyhood dream of mine to uh, to fly jets and land on carriers, uh, and I did that. I was in the first Gulf War, Desert Storm, uh, which was uh, was was really a, a crazy time in my life, and I found myself uh, as a result of the Navy at a shore tour in Carnegie Mellon university out of Pittsburgh. And most people know Carnegie Mellon is a true bastion of geekery. Uh, This was in the 90s, the early 90s, got my MBA there. And I saw the internet emerge. And I uh, left the Navy uh, and actually created the very first financial service on the internet. Uh, the first stock quote server, the first mutual fund site, uh, I mean, first portfolio manager. This was pre-Yahoo, pre-Netscape, uh, in fact, uh, pre-AOL uh, going on the internet. Uh, and uh, when I was 29 years old, uh, we, we put Charles Schwab on the net and over 100 different financial institutions. I mean, it was, it was crazy, you know, as a 28-year-old building this company. I did it with a, a gentleman, Joel Mask, who was my, my, my partner there. And we, we, just, we just built an incredible company. And we, uh, the company was acquired by Intuit. Uh, and, and, and Intuit is a, you know, they're major, you know, major fintech company. Uh, they do TurboTax and Quicken and Quicken Financial Network and, you know, multi-billion dollar company. And so we sold that to them uh, or they acquired it, I like to say. And uh, I, I ran uh, business development for them. And then I wound up doing another company uh, out of Carnegie Mellon which was in the artificial intelligence space. And I did it with Ken Lang, who is our uh, Cosmo Ventures, our, our CTO. And he's one of these guys who's like a you know, total polymath, you know, 40 patents, PhD, crazy number of degrees, you can't even count them. And he and I did an AI company. We sold it uh, to Lycos. They acquired us. Lycos went public. They were the number two search engine behind Yahoo back in the 90s. 
Uh, this is pre-Google. And since then, I've been building companies and selling companies and, and, and that kind of thing. I did another company, which was acquired by Nielsen. So I've always been kind of the CEO, COO type of entrepreneur. And around eight years ago, uh, I decided uh, that, you know, I'm in my 50s. I decided at that time, I was late 40s. I said, look, you know, I need to get on the investment side. I need to be a venture capitalist where I can help as many entrepreneurs as I could versus just taking a single bet on my own uh, activities. And that led me to uh, Cosmo Ventures, where I met my partner, uh, Kiran Hines, who's also a uh, Irish entrepreneur. And we decided let's create a firm to really focus on early stage uh, tech companies. And that's what we've been doing for the last seven years. Pretty crazy story, uh, but it's been a lot of fun. Wow. And just listening to your story there, hearing you say things like Lycos, AOL, Netscape, Navigator, just brings back memories and flashbacks of GeoCities and the sound of a modem connecting. Do you miss those days? I I, I do. I do. In <laughs> fact, you know, a funny story, you mentioned GeoCities. Actually, GeoCities, which, you know, uh, most people don't even realize they, they had the personal homepage uh, kind of thing where anybody could create a, a homepage, right? They were bought by Yahoo. We actually almost uh, sold our company. Uh, instead of selling it to Lycos, we almost sold it to them. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so it's a, it's a pretty wild time. Love that. And of course, that path eventually led you to Cosimo Ventures. So can you tell the listeners a little bit more about the kind of problems that you, you're uh, solving with your tech here? And, and yeah, you so set look, today? I, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So blockchain, blockchain is a pretty, pretty extraordinary technology. And this is, I, I like to say uh, that this is the single largest value creation event in our lifetime. Yeah. And, and that means a lot coming from somebody who kind of lived through dot-com and the mobile phase and the e-commerce phase. And when you when you when you think about the internet, right? What the internet did was it, it decentralized, or it made our lives peer to peer. It networked our lives. It, you know, the early days of the internet was all about content. Right? Anybody could publish content about anything, and today anybody can publish videos about anything. And the second phase of the internet was all about you know peer to peer communication, where you can have a phone call or a video call. For, for no cost all around the world. You know, I've been on video calls in my car with people in Australia, right? And, and, it, and it doesn't cost any, anything extra. So the internet really made that possible. And then the third phase of the internet was really all about the kind of the peer-to-peer -peer decentralization of commerce, where all of a sudden anybody could sell anything to anybody. I could put antiques up on Etsy and sell them worldwide. Uh, it, it's, you know, Amazon, all of these things, right? I, I used to, when I was a kid, my mom used to take me to Sears to buy my clothes, to go back to school, uh, wear Sears, right? Yeah. So, so, you know, it, the internet has changed our lives, but the one thing it hasn't changed is banking. And, and so, um, you know, in trust and those kinds of things, we still rely on these central uh, institutions of, of trust. And so blockchain fixes that. Blockchain allows us to have basically uh, financial transactions without a middleman. And so this is going to affect everything in our lives. And that's why Cosmo Ventures is really focused on this because this is, you know, this is a huge event. You know, I, my partners and I say, man, we've seen this movie before. We've been in this movie <laughs> before. <laughs> and and uh, we know how it's going to end and it's going to end great because it ended great for us uh, in the other movies. So let's, uh, let's go after this. I'm so glad you said that because it really does feel like this space is – there's something special around it in the exact same way as the arrival of the internet and the dot com. It, it, anyone that's lived through it, it, it really feels so similar, doesn't it? There's a lot of parallels there. That's right. That's right. And and, and that you know, it, the only the only thing, Neil, is that it's happening faster. Number yep. one, uh, it's accelerated drastically, right? Because you know, when the internet launched, there was no internet to share it to promote it. Whereas now. Um, or, or, or adding a, a new capability to the internet and the internet exists to basically spread it worldwide. So, so, you know, this is, this is happening very, very quickly. And the amount of capital that's entering this market is astounding. It's astounding, you know, uh, it, it, investors are, are, and it's global. It, it is an absolute global phenomenon. Whereas I, I think the early days of the internet was really driven out of Silicon Valley and out of Boston, 
And then once it kind of caught on, it went global. Uh, whereas this, this is primarily being driven globally uh, first. And I would say Silicon Valley, you know, not even second, maybe third or fourth. Yeah. I think one of the things that's also very similar, you've probably seen these clips. There's one clip of Bill Gates on the Letterman show talking about how the internet's going to change the world. Everyone in the audience and Dave Letterman was just mocking him. That will never catch on. And then even a few years later, there was, I think it was David Bowie on uh, the Paxman show over here in the UK saying how the internet was going to revolutionize music. Again, it was almost mocking him. Well, that's never going to happen. And if you try and have a chat about blockchain or crypto with somebody outside of the industry, they do give you that similar kind of look, don't they? Like you're some kind of heretic. Absolutely. Look, uh, the old guard has to protect the turf. Yeah, they got to protect what they're doing, and they're under threat. Um, what's interesting here is that uh, a lot of them will will talk, uh, you know, will trash talk, but then when you you look at what the actions are, right? So you got Jamie Dimon out there saying, you know, Bitcoin won't, you know, Bitcoin won't go anywhere, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. But meanwhile, he's got an army of people, you know, working on blockchain and he's got his own currency, you know, and he's, yep. he's doing all kinds of things uh, with blockchain. So I, I, what's interesting about this time is I think the bigger institutions have learned uh, from the internet and from e-commerce. Uh, and I, I see them all jumping in very quickly. They're they're spooling up groups of people. Fidelity's got hundreds, literally hundreds of people, multiple hundreds of people working on digital assets. Uh, they're not going to get caught, uh, you know, with the proverbial pants down here uh, and get disrupted. So I, I I see the institutions coming in uh, to this, you know, as as we speak, uh, you know, as we speak. And that, and, and and quite frankly, that's a magical moment. Yeah. Uh, and, and what I mean by magical moment is the thing I've learned uh, in building tech companies is that you have to follow the adoption cycle. You got to look at, and you got to understand where you are in that adoption cycle. You know, all tech kind of follows this this kind of formula. These visionary it starts off with visionaries who come up with the tech, and they're generally five percent of the population. And they build this and they do it just because it's cool. It's revolutionary. Then comes the early adopters. These are the people who aren't really quite visionary, but they get what the vision is and they jump in. And again, they're not, they're really enamored with what it means and what, what it could be and how big it could be. And that general group of the population is around 10 to 12%. So when you combine those two, you got about 15% of the market. When that group kind of grabs a hold of a technology and they and it and it starts growing and inspiring the mass market which is 40 you know, of the market uh, I call those kind of the the uh, early majority when the early majority sees what this this other group has done and they start jumping in that's when all the value uh, takes off that's where as investors that's where you're going to get your alpha that's where you're going to get your return and that happened in the internet right around 1997 when there was around 150 200 million people online and then it went right and and you know we hit a bubble uh but then we the bubble popped and then and then it went even you know way beyond uh you know where it was i would say that blockchain is right now where we were on the internet in 1997. There's around 150, 200 million people. Uh, the early adopters are now inspiring the early majority. The institutions are jumping on board saying, holy cow, I got to pay attention to this. And then magically you've got governments coming in and saying, we got to regulate this, which is great. Right. People say, oh no, the, the government is regulating. No. Yeah. When a government regulates something, it reduces uncertainty. It makes it safer. When it reduces uncertainty and makes it safer, guess what? More people adopt. Think of regulation as guardrails. Do you want to drive down that mountain path? Okay. At high speed in your car without a guardrail? No, you want a guardrail because in case you screw up or the car breaks or something happens, you don't go down the cliff. It's the same kind of thing. And so I look at government coming in with regulation 
uh, as a very positive thing. Every single time the government puts some kind of indicator in place, the market rallies, more value is created, more people jump in. That's such Trump. an important point. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's something we don't get to hear very often at all. And uh, and also, when I was researching you before you came on the podcast, I read how your belief of modern banking hasn't actually changed since the 1400s. So can you set the scene and tell the listeners a little bit more about why that and, and, and why it needs to change? Exactly. So look, banking, you know, Medici, Cosmo Medici. In fact, I named uh, we named our firm Cosmo after Cosmo Medici, the Medici family out of Florence uh, in the 14, you know, uh, 1400s, they invented banking. Uh, and, 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 and when you think about what a bank does, you know, Neil, if I want to have a transaction with you and you don't know me and I don't know you, what do we do? We put a bank in between us to clear the trade because we both trust the bank. Yeah. So we've created these kind of central institutions of trust. Right? If you think about buying a house, you use a broker. If you buy stock, you use a broker. If you buy insurance, you use somebody in between. These, these, you know, when you go get a uh, a passport, you go to the State Department. They're a central institution of trust that you trust them to give you a passport that says Rob Frasca is really Rob Frasca. So our entire society is built on these institutions of trust. Well, the problem is, is when you take and, and by the way, banking, this, our banking systems haven't changed since then. They're the same, but. But what's happened, Neil, is our entire world has changed yeah. because we're networked. And, and, and it used to be where we weren't networked, but now we are. And when you take a bank, a central point of failure, and you connect it to a network, it becomes a honeypot. It, people attack it. They try to steal money. They hack it. They do things. It becomes a weakness, not a strength. So when Bitcoin came out, uh, it used blockchain. And what Bitcoin proved is that we can have a trade without a bank. We can clear the trade. So instead of having a, instead of having a single uh, bank that clears the trade that says, Rob gave Neil $10, now what we can have is a network of people that said, Rob gave Neil 10 Bitcoin. And, the, and, and we asked the network of, of, of millions of people, did that trade actually happen? Did Rob not double spend it? Did Neil actually get the money? And let's record it so that everybody can see it and, and, and make sure that it's secure. And that's what, that's what blockchain does. So, so all of a sudden now we've got this new technology that, that essentially changes all the fabric of society. This is a big thing. This is a this is a huge thing. It's it's a it's a it's a it's a really you know super super thing. It's 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 peer to peer, a peer to peer trust. Um, and and so, you know what happens is is that uh, uh, there's going to be a lot of value uh, that's created here. And since the power has long been in the hands of these intermediaries that you just perfectly highlighted there, we have been at the mercy of market fluctuations and currency volatility. But with 1% interest rates, if you're lucky, I'm seeing more and more people searching for alternative investments in everything from wine, sneakers, racehorses, and of course, crypto. Is that something that you're seeing over in the US too? Yeah, absolutely. So, so what what's happened is is that these this blockchain technology has allowed us to create a new way of value exchange uh, and new forms of value. And um, and so what's happened here is that uh, we have essentially developed alternative asset classes. You know, again, let's go back to the bank model. Yeah. So, if I have a bank. And I want to have a transaction. I want to give you, Neil, $10 and you want that $10 and we go through the bank. What's the business model for that transaction? Well, the bank gets paid. They get a transaction fee. I go to the ATM, okay, uh, and I take money out and I got to pay a fee. Why? Because the bank is, is giving me out the cash. They're, they're, they're charging me a fee because they're trust and they give me the cash. What happens if there's no bank, but there's a network? There's a network of people. What's the business model there? Well, the business model there is, is that everybody in the network needs to get paid somehow for essentially providing the trust, providing the trade, the clearing of the trade. And so that's why you have things like these cryptocurrencies. Really what they are is networks of people uh, providing various value and, and they're getting paid. So, 
you know, th- there's an opportunity here for people to essentially participate in these networks and own the, uh, the currency of these networks and, and, uh, and potentially earn. And so we have these new products, essentially, where people can earn uh, for providing essentially a lot of the same services that the bank was providing. And so this is this is a really, uh, really important time. Uh, And, you know, one percent is just, uh, you know, interest rates are are just crazy. You know, there's really not a lot of income products out there. And, and so, you know, I think people are looking at saying, you know, how do I, how do I join these, these networks and, 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 and earn more uh, value by joining and participating in these networks? And with this, what feels like a seismic shift, can you expand on the realities of market volatility and the benefits of owning your savings for the long term? Yeah, so, so um, that's, a, that's a super question. And I, I get asked that uh, quite, a, quite a bit. But let's go back to the statement that I said. Yeah. I think it's important that you understand where you are in the terms of the adoption market, the, the, the adoption cycle. So, you know, um, this is there's a there's a ton of people who are participating in this market and looking for short term gains. They're speculators. They they go into a market, they buy something, they wait for it to go up and then they dump it and they t- and they take money out. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that if that's what you want to do. My perspective is is different. Uh, my perspective is looking at what happened with the internet, looking at long term, and looking at where we are in the market cycle. If only ten percent of the world is using a technology, and it's growing rapidly, insanely fast, exponentially, then um, buying now into this and selling it now is kind of like the analogy I like to use is, you know, buying Amazon at the IPO, doubling your money uh, in a year or two and thinking you're a rock star. (laughs) Okay. Because we all know what happened to Amazon. Another good example is, and it's not tech, but it's a good example is Gilead, right? Gilead made protease inhibitors, drugs for AIDS. And, you know, I bought that at IPO and I, I doubled my money and I sold it. Okay. Oops. Because you know it went out at three hundred million, and what's it at now? I don't know. Over, I, I, I can't even look. Over a hundred billion. You know, yeah. oops. Um, you know, boy, uh, I thought I was a rock star. So you you, you got to look at it. I, I think long term here. You, you know, um, to to do that short term trading and speculation, you really got to know what you're doing. You you got to have access. You've got to. You've got to know the teams. You got to know what's going on. It's it's almost a full time job. Whereas I think a long term and hold kind of approach, uh, diversified is is you know I'm not giving investment advice here. I don't have a crypto crystal ball. Yeah. Okay, but my philosophy is my personal philosophy is go long term here. Go long term. Yeah, and who could forget that guy? I think he he bought two Papa John's pizzas for ten thousand Bitcoin. Yeah, <laughs> I think it was about eleven Oops. years ago, which was yeah, probably exactly three point eight billion. Imagine being yeah. that guy. Imagine, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, right. Uh, and 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 that I I, I absolutely uh, think you got to be thinking uh, long term. Yeah, completely agree with you. And on that, can you tell me a little bit more about Endow, which is dubbed the first adaptive digital currency? Can you just set yeah? The so for we we that's not heard of that. Yeah, we invested in a project uh, called Endow uh, as a fund, and uh, we're pretty big proponents of uh, the team and what they're building. It's a it's a it's a long term store of value, and people say, "Well, what the, what the heck is a long term store of value?" Right? Uh, gold is a long term store of value. Uh, Bitcoin is a long term store of value. In fact, the one of the largest asset classes out there is a long term store of value. It's the idea that I'm going to put some value somewhere that is uncorrelated or hopefully uncorrelated with the the rest of the market. Uh, you know, when when people worry about inflation or they worry about the market, they tend to buy gold. Uh, because they know that gold will always have value or they buy real estate, right? Because they think, okay, they're not making any more real estate and, and long-term I might be able to sell it. So what, what Endow is, is trying to do is learn from Bitcoin 
Uh, we love Bitcoin. We think Bitcoin is a is a is a really incredible thing. Um, but we think that there's room for learning from Bitcoin and trying to create uh, something um, that is uh, you know th that that learns from the market and tries to create something that that's uh, that's going to really capture the market. So what Endout does is it 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 it's a proof of stake currency, meaning that if you hold it and you stake it, you earn more of it. And, and you know, it's kind of like almost like a yield. It's not a yield, but you, you earn more because you're staking it. So Endow is a currency that's designed to be a long next generation, long-term store of value. Uh, it, 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 it's adaptive in that it has uh, algorithms that look at its market uh, supply, its monetary policy, its market supply and demand. And it actually adjusts the uh, market uh, supply and demand on the fly to uh, in an attempt to reduce volatility. So imagine having a currency that's designed to grow in value as the network grows in value that has a yield. Um, you know, like if you hold it up, if you lock it for three years and stake it, you earn 15% annualized. Uh, and um, it has uh, adaptive controls to kind of reduce it, reduce volatility. So it's pretty cool. Uh, there's around $40 million worth of the currency that's been issued, which means there's some 12,000 people that have come in to the project and bought it and, and are holding it. Uh, it I, I like to think it's probably one of the biggest projects you've never heard of. Uh, they, they, they're, they're not huge marketers, the guys. Uh, <laughs> I think they're trying to change that. Uh, it's on KuCoin. You can go on KuCoin and buy it. Um, and, uh, it, you know, it's a pretty, uh, pretty innovative uh, project. So a decentralized trusted ecosystem where Endow uh, holders can digitally self-govern will sound incredibly appealing to some people listening. So can you just walk me through a brief explainer of, of how it all works, possibly provide a use case too? Yeah. So, so, so um, all remember now, let's go again, let's go back to what we were talking about. Uh, when you have a bank, uh, banks are governed by the people that run the bank, right? But what happens when you have a network? How do you govern that? How do you govern the network? And so you need some kind of some kind of decentralized governance system. So the way Endow does it is they 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 actually uh, all holders uh, of Endow get get a vote. And there's this thing called the Blockchain Policy Council made up of nine members. And anybody can propose um, changes or modifications or ideas to uh, for vote. And then uh, the Blockchain Policy Council reviews it and it goes up for a vote for everybody. And that's how the overall blockchain is, is, uh, is governed. Uh, in fact, most a, a lot of these blockchain systems, it's not it's nothing super unique for Endow, you know, Tezos and, and Casper and others uh, out there have these kind of digitally self-governing systems uh, that uh, allow the holders to uh, to vote. You know, imagine imagine if uh, if if as a U.S. dollar holder, you could you could vote on 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 uh, the U.S. monetary policy. Uh, nope, <laughs> not right. <laughs> uh, but that's what's happening here uh, in in uh, in the blockchain world. And I would imagine that we've done a well. I think we've done a great job of actually setting the scene for new people to this space. But I suspect we'll also have uh, some of your loyal communities uh, tuning in from things like Telegram and Reddit, etc., hoping for some kind of teaser or update on what's on the horizon. So, what's next for you? Is there anything else you can share about what we can expect in twenty twenty two and beyond? Well, I think uh, for for Endow in 2022, uh, once again, I'm not I'm not day to day management uh, of yeah. of of the uh, of the project. I, I'm an investor, uh, and I, I'm I'm actively involved. There's a very large ecosystem of people uh, that are all helping with Endow. Uh, you, you know, anybody can jump in. It's open source. Uh, we've got people building wallets. More people are running nodes. Uh, people are marketing. Uh, there's a promotional uh, team out there of literally tens of thousands of people uh, marketing and, 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 and marketing Endow worldwide. Uh, in fact, every week I look and, you know, there's literally people from 20, 30 countries uh, owning Endow. So it's really exciting to, uh, to see the growth. I think 2022 is more ecosystem growth. 
uh, for the currency. Uh, the currency is native uh, to the Cosmos uh, Tendermint uh, consensus engine. I, I wouldn't be surprised uh, if uh, we see an ERC-20 wrapped version of Endow for things like Uniswap and DeFi. Uh, that, that, wouldn't, uh, that wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised to see just more uh, mainstream adoption, more exchanges, uh, more places to, uh, to, buy, uh, to buy Endow. Love that. And I feel we've come full circle now. We began our conversation talking about your origin story, those great days in the the 90s of the arrival of the internet. But I'm now going to ask you, what has been the soundtrack to your career in tech? Is there one particular song that has accompanied oh, you throughout that journey? Holy God, what song? Let me think. Uh, well, I don't know. Let's see. Probably because I flew in the Navy, Top Gun. Uh, I wasn't Top Gun, but uh, Top Gun came out when I was in there. Probably Welcome to the, was that the Danger Zone? Welcome to the Danger Zone? Yeah, Kenny Loggins, <laughs> man. Uh, you can't go wrong with that choice. Love it. <laughs> I will be adding that with, to our Spotify playlist proudly. I might, even, uh, I might even rock out and sing along to it. It's been a few You know, years if you're not, it. as an entrepreneur and as an investor, you, you got to kind of push things to the edge, right? You got to, yeah. you got to take things uh, to the danger zone uh, to, to really, uh, you know, out of your comfort zone a little bit uh, to really explore the boundaries of your life. And, that, and that's what I've always tried to do in everything uh, in my life. And so, yeah, I guess it's a good song. Now I think yeah. about it. It's a tough one. And I suppose you surprised me with that one. <laughs> <laughs> and for anyone listening, wanting to find out more information about anything that we've talked about today, we've covered a lot in a short amount of time. What's the, the best places on the web to find you guys? I would say that, uh, there's two, there's two areas, maybe three areas. Uh, the first is, uh, Cosmo X.com. Yep. which is our venture fund, CosmoX.com. That's a tokenized fund open to uh, investors of various types, qualified investors uh, worldwide. Uh, to, to check out Endow, uh, I would go to endow.io, N-D-A-U.io. Uh, in fact, if you Google Endow and click on videos, you'll be blown away. There's couple hundred thousand videos out there people talking about and that which is kind of exciting uh and i'm also at um uh, on twitter at rob frasca uh so uh you can you can you can check me out there uh and and that's yeah i guess that's it Oh, well, I'll add all those links to the show notes so people can find you nice and easily. So much I've loved about our conversation today, starting with your story right at the beginning there and the, the arrival of the internet and how it feels remarkably similar now with what we're experiencing. But more than anything, just your story. And uh, I can't wait for tech conferences to return. We can grab a cold beer in Boston and uh, Fire away Top Gun quotes deep into the night, but more than anything, <laughs> that, I, that sounds that sounds like a lot of fun, Neil. I'd enjoy that. I consider this: less than fifty percent of people in the world currently have a bank account, and yet seventy-five percent of the world's population have smartphones. I mean, let that sink in: fifty percent of people have a bank account, and seventy-five percent of the world have a smartphone, and more than fifty percent of those who have smartphones have prepaid accounts. So we now have the technology to allow 75% of the world to have true cross-border banking. It always feels like a personal property, personal finance revolution, owning the property rights to your money versus bank control, etc. And those are further observations that I was reading about, Rob, that really got me thinking about this seismic shift. But over to you, is there anything that we've talked about today got you thinking differently? Please share your insights, expertise, questions, pictures to come on the show, whatever it is. Tech blog writer at outlook.com, techblogwriter.co.uk, and get me on LinkedIn, Twitter, etc. at Neil C. Hughes. What a great guest there. Rob got me thinking about so many different things. Looking back to my uh, past and creating websites on GeoCities to where we're heading now, and it's exciting times, it really is. So keep those messages coming in and I'll return tomorrow. So thank you for listening and until next time. Don't be a stranger. 
Thank you for listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast with Neil C. Hughes. Remember, technology works best when it brings people together.